So, um, understanding rodents. So in order to have preventative measures or corrective measures that apply, you need to know which rodent you're dealing with. Um, oh, sorry, there's one, there's one back here. There's one hantavirus pulmonary syndrome uh, that has been uh, in the Okanagan Valley. There's been a couple of cases of this. And it's associated, the only known source is wild deer mice. And uh, it's a respiratory illness. So when you breathe it in, it can cause uh, respiratory illness. And so the reason I just highlight that is later on in protective measures, it's the reason why you want to have masks and that type of thing. So I'll talk about it later. So it's just sort of highlighting that that's the case. And in Canada and BC, it's been down in the lower mainland, or not lower mainland, lower Okanagan. So I use down that direction. And I, I'm not aware of it coming up as far as this. But it's still a good idea to take precautions. Okay, so understanding rodents. Um, I put on here the three main ones that come into domestic locations. The Norway rat, the black rat or roof rat, and the house mouse. So the Norway rat is the largest. Um, it has the largest dropping. So when you're trying to figure out which, you don't often see the, the animals themselves. And so you're looking for um, the indications of, of what animal is there. And so quite often they leave well, not often, they leave a lot of droppings. And based on the droppings, their size and their shape, you can tell which kind uh, of animal you're dealing with. So the largest one, the Norway rat, has one to two centimeter size dropping and rounded ends. The roof rat has a bit smaller, one and a half, one to one and a half centimeters, and it's got pointy ends. And then the house mouse has little tiny droppings with pointed ends. There are also things that you can look at is where on your property or in your house that they're, uh, you're seeing the signs. So the Norway rat, that's looking at uh, moist conditions. They like to prefer being on the ground, moist areas. Uh, they quite often nest in crawl spaces and burrows uh, and around building perimeters. The black rat, they like up high. So they're nesting in ceilings and in attics. They want to be up high. And so you're going to see droppings and other um, types of um, indications, gnawing wood or, or insulation or anything like that, is going to be up in the ceiling and attic versus the Norway rat, which is lower. The house mouse, it, um, has, it likes hidden secluded areas. Uh, it wants to hide in enclosed spaces. It quite often uses shredded paper. Uh, I was in a restaurant once who had a trouble with this one mouse, really pesky. They eventually found it, and they had gone into it had gone into the uh, old tax receipts or the tax assessment package, <laughs> right? Where you had to supposed to keep them for seven years. Well, this mouse was right in the middle of the box, and it had this beautiful nest of shriveled paper, right? And uh, the tax man wouldn't have been very happy. So that's the kind of place <laughs> that they like to, to be. Uh, they also can squeeze through really tiny spaces. So a mouse, uh, well either one, all they have to do is get their head, their skull, through the opening. Um, so for a mouse, that can be as small as a dime, roughly, and, um, and then a rat, a little bit bigger, right? So quarter to a loony size at the most, so like we're looking at an inch is the openings that they can get into, and a mouse would be even half an inch or smaller. Okay. Uh, so when we're thinking about preventative measures, the trick is to see your house and your yard the way a mouse or a rat would. So they consider your house and your yard as their habitat. So in order to make them uncomfortable, you have to eliminate what they need to survive, right? You want to get rid of the food, you want to get rid of the water, and you want to get rid of shelter or places for harborage and feeling cozy. So, uh, so for food, sources eliminating food, so it's garbage, uh, keeping pest food con pest proof containers, the tight fitting lids, right? You're going to fill, uh, follow good composting practices. Uh, you don't want to throw food scraps into your backyard compost without at least covering them up properly. You want to use lime, rotate your compost. Uh, have a pest proof containers, so the metal, metal containers um, are, are the best. Remove fallen fruit and nuts, right? Anything that they can get into, 
Uh, they eat, um, they're pretty much, they'll eat omnivores, right? They'll eat a little bit of everything that they can have, that they can find. They prefer, uh, quite often they'll prefer the seeds and that type of thing, but they will eat anything that they come across. Uh, pet food, if you have an animal that you're feeding, um, providing, thank you, providing enough, um, uh, just enough food for them to eat at that time, rather than leaving more and letting the, the animal, your pet, to a dog, cat, you know, chicken, whatever it is, um, come regularly throughout the day, give enough that they can eat, and then take it away, um, especially overnight. Same thing with bird feeders, trays, uh, clean up spilled seeds often, right? So you're trying to get rid of uh, that. Sources of water, dripping taps, dripping water, um, if you have a pool or a, whirl, a hot tub or a whirlpool in your backyard, cover that up. Uh, if there's little puddles or little depressions in your property or uh, bird feeder or anything like that where there's water, um, you're wanting to eliminate that. Hiding places, same thing, you're trying to get rid of, make them uncomfortable. They're an animal that gets preyed on by everything, so they're twitchy and fussy and, and, and don't like to be out in the open, so that means don't have them give them places that they can hide. Remove your lumber, especially if it's close to your house, uh, or, or piles of junk, or uh, places like a couch. Some people have couches for outdoor deck areas. Uh, remove all those kinds of things. Sometimes there's um, grass or shrubs close to a house, right? They're gonna try to stay as close as they can to the edges of the house. They don't like to be out in the open because cats and hawks, birds, will catch them. And so they're going to be staying tight to the close to the perimeter of your house. So then get rid of it. There's tall grass or bushes that they can scurry under and stay hidden. That's, that's a place where they can go. So if you remove that, then they're able to, um, they're not as comfortable. It's not a, a habitat, a space that they feel safe in anymore. So that's what you're trying to, to do. Uh, okay. So once you've once you've done that, I'm sorry if I'm far away, that picture is difficult to see. It's just a picture of the yard. Um, you want to pest proof your building. So now, if you've made it on an, an environment that they're not wanting to stay in, you can then move on to preventing them from um, coming into your house, right? So again, think, think like a mouse. Look at your property like a mouse. Look for tiny secluded places, the size of a dime or a quarter that they can get into. Uh, close those off, block them off, move any shrubs away from that. Um, if there's the next picture, um, I think that's all. So you want to uh, cover vents, fresh air intakes, um, metal screening, quite small, quarter of an inch, because we're talking about mice, right, and how small that they can get into. Okay, here's a, uh, oops. Uh-oh, not working. Did I turn it off somehow? Oh, oh, okay, I see. Don't forget to restart it. Okay. <laughs> Is it gonna work out? Uh, here's another picture of a house, a typical yard. So this one, I, I like this picture only, these are just off the internet, right? They're just, I Googled them and brought some pictures up. So this one has the tree. Right? So this is in particularly important for mice or for the roof rat, if that's what you're dealing with. It's a way that the animal can get, gain access to the upper part of your house. So turning back the branches or having shrubs and things farther away from your house. Um, and then there's just different places and openings. Um, don't forget that in the summertime, when we leave doors and windows open for fresh air, there's an opportunity, or are we going in and out of the house all the time, there's an opportunity for them to come in. Uh, in the fall, especially, you want to be careful or more conscious of it because in the fall, they're looking for a nice warm place to spend the winter. And uh, your house is perfect. <laughs> and so um, you might be seeing more um, rodent entry into buildings in the, in the fall. Uh, and then the only other comment I wanted to make about this is that if you're blocked off from one area or from one house, uh, animals can move from, so you made one environment not livable for those animals, they're going to go to another location, they're going to go looking. And that 
if you like maybe moving them from your house and now you ended up in your garage or at your neighbor's house or something like that. And so if there's um, more than one house in an area that's having problems, it might be worth coordinating your efforts so it happens at the same time. Uh, okay, so science of um, rodent infestation. Um, this is just, again, I mentioned it already, this, these pictures show a little bit of what we're looking for. Rodent droppings, we talked about that already. Chew marks on wood or food or food packaging, you might see it. Um, dirty rub marks along frequently used routes. So on the top, it's a little bit hard to see, but the top picture, you see those brown sort of smudgy areas? That's going to be from the animals are in dirty places that got mud and dirt and greasy, oily kind of fur. And like I said before, they're staying as close to the building perimeter as they can to avoid predators. And so they're going to kind of rub their bodies along the wall as they run along. And you end up, they go back and forth, they quite often use the same route, back and forth. Um, a mouse typically lives, its nest is typically like five to 10 feet away from its food source. They don't actually travel that far. And so they're taking the same path back and forth. And they end up with these smudge marks. So you might see that. Uh, you also might hear noises in the wall, scurrying sounds or that kind of thing. And so in the picture at the bottom, uh, again, it's just from the internet. You might see lots of droppings, uh, insulation or paper all ripped up. Uh, you might see chewed wires or brown stains. Um, this is for presence of, of, of a rat in, in the attic there, but um, those kinds of things are signs that you might see. <laughs> okay, so corrective measures. Uh, traps, um, both the snap trap, uh, are, they're very mean. They're, um, they, it, death is, is, is so instant that it's considered a humane method. And, uh, or live traps, either are effective. Especially with rats, you want to bait, uh, but even mice, I've had a mouse in my house, it was, took us a long time to get rid of it. Um, but if you bait the trap first, let them become comfortable. And so again, we think about the rodent and how they live their life, and they're always they're nervous, skitterish. They're always wondering if something's going to kill them, and so they don't. They're going to be suspicious of the trap at first. So put food out on it. Maybe something that they've already been eating, and you know that they've been eating. Uh, sometimes when I eventually brought the mouse, we had I tied string. <laughs> that was the only thing because we had to really tug on it, and it finally was the what caught him. But all of those things make them comfortable. But so a couple of days, a few days for them to be comfortable with that and you're eating it, you notice that it's being eaten, then set your trap so that the next time they come along, um, they can, um, it'll actually catch them. Uh, check the traps daily and, uh, and of course that's for humane reasons as well. And to make sure that the next, the rodents don't go, oh wow, this thing kills you, it better not go there. Um, you want to you wanna clean them up. <clears throat> quite often people will say, cats, oh I have a mouse problem, get a cat. Um, it, they could be somewhat effective, but uh, they might not be such a good idea. Cats can bring the rodent into the house. They can also then get the disease themselves or be the, the vector of disease transferring illness into your home. And then if your beloved Fifi um, could also become injured, right? Because they're, they're uh, the, the rat or the, the mouse or whatever doesn't want to be caught. So your cat could also become injured and that's not a good thing. Uh, ultrasound repellers is another product that's out there. They're effective at first, they're expensive, but then over time the, the animals get used to it and then they're not as effective anymore. If you're getting to the point where you think you need poison or poison baits, I just suggest um, start working with a, a professional. Right there, you can have unintentional harm um, from the poisons and so it's just it's probably, if you're getting to that point, it's probably best to start talking to someone who, uh, who does this for a living. And then of course, if you happen to get your mouse and everything else, or your, your rat or whatnot you're dealing with, then make sure that those preventative measures are in place so that you don't get reinfestation. Okay, this is my last slide. So cleaning up after rodents. Um, 
So they make a mess, right? They've got all this messy material. They've got poop everywhere. Um, and what do you do? And this is the part where protecting yourself. You want to wear a well-fitted filter on your a mask on your face. And this is back to the hantavirus from the deer mice. Most, um, like domestic mouse, house mouse, most of them are not going to be carrying this, um, this virus. But there's a chance that a deer mouse might be there. And that's why we, we recommend the um, dust mask. Um, uh, rubber gloves, goggles, whole thing. Uh, you want to wash, and this here is being um, washing rubber gloves. This is to wash. As soon as you wash, you have germs on your hands. So you're touching something dirty. You now have germs on your hands. When you wash, you're taking the germs and you're rinsing them down the sink. That's essentially what's happening. If you if you have your rubber gloves on and you wash them, that's taking some of the germs away and lowering the amount of pathogens that could be there. Then you can wash your hands after that. That's why it's kind of doing it in a double step. It's just extra precaution. You want hot water, lots of soap, lots of scrubbing, and uh, washing it away down the drain. Um, venting, stirring up the dust. Uh, you want to ventilate the area well. You do not want to use sweeping or vacuuming. It's a bad idea because you're going to inhale it. So you want to wet it down. It's quite a strong bleach solution. So one to 10 parts uh, water. So that works with roughly a quarter cup of bleach to a liter of water. If you're uh, thinking about in your mind, and better than that, than 100 milliliters, that doesn't mean anything to me. So a quarter cup in a, in a liter of water. Um, yeah, and you want to wipe up. So gather, wet it all down, get, take paper towel and gather and wipe it up. Dispose of it in the garbage. Um, double bag contents, uh, just so someone else doesn't get exposed if it happened to open in the garbage or somewhere else. Clean floors, carpets, clothing, bedding, and disinfect countertops. Again, with a strong bleach solution or other strong um, quaternary ammonia type disinfectant. Um, and then sometimes people wonder, like some, some objects you can't disinfect, you can't throw a couch. In the, in the washing machine, it doesn't work. Uh, and so what do you do, right? I mean, sometimes get those types of comments. Uh, things that are small enough that can go into a dryer, you can't wash it, get it wet, but it can be dried. They can go into the dryer. The desiccating effect, which is the drying effect, viruses and bacteria aren't able to survive very well. So putting something in the dryer is a disinfecting method for something that can't get wet. And then, um, and then even so for a couch or something like that, you could try to clean it as best as you can. If you need to disinfect it, another is to go put it outside in the sunshine. Um, and I mean, it's, it's not perfect. It's not the really strong bleach solution, but the UV light, UV um, will have a damaging effect on bacteria and viruses. So yeah. Um, and then there's some resources. Anybody is welcome to give me a call. I uh, have business cards if anyone else have handed a few out and you're welcome to give me a call and uh, here as well. And there's some uh, links there. Um, I passed out the health link to the council members and to Mayor. Uh, and if you have any um, questions, then please feel free to contact me. Council Brothers. Uh, there's been a proliferation of rooms in the last year or so. Is that something that we can anticipate going? I mean, is this just an unusual year and if so, why was that? Or can we anticipate that's going to happen um, long term going forward? Uh, to be honest, I'm not sure. I mean, the meeting that I went to in March where it was first mentioned, I kind of went, really? Wow. But I didn't realize that we had rodents in the interior. Um, I haven't been inspecting food, and food facilities in that type of thing for a few years. So it was a bit of a surprise to me, but apparently uh, the city of Kelowna is also experiencing rodents, and it's um, uh, like 2015 or so was a fairly new event that was starting to happen in, in Kelowna. So I, I'm just not up on whether it's a trend or if they've just been introduced to the interior or what, I don't know. Yeah, I'm sorry. Congratulations. So one way of measuring that in the interior of BC is how busy are the rodent controlled private companies that we have in our area. Because that's 
see some fairly new vehicles driving around, and to me that's an indicator that they're making money. <laughs> um, so, you know, the mayor just went to the Silver Conference, and Kelowna has put forward a resolution that will go forward to the government that this is a, this is a problem that's increasing in the interior of BC, not just Revenstoke, and I know Kelowna has a problem with them as well. And I wonder how tied it is to um, climate change as well. Possible. I, I, um, vectors and increasing um, disease is, is part of uh, climate change and, and linked to health, right? So when you look at some of the things that are linked, health issues that are linked to climate change, increase in vector-borne diseases uh, is there. I think when you think about vector-borne diseases, it's quite often more insect-related. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, mosquitoes carrying um, a West Nile virus, what have you, shifting northward, uh, that type of thing. I'm not sure, but, you know, it, it's, I guess it's not unreasonable, it's not a stretch to also say that it could be possibly rodents, I don't know. Great, because the other one that's increasing is Lyme disease. <coughs> right. Ticks. Yeah. Okay, so be it's interested to hear what you find out on that. Right. And it could just also be as things move, right, shift, they're moving, um, those animals are actually moving, shifting in geographic areas, right, they're moving themselves, mm -hmm. whether it's the climate that's actually affecting that or whether they just hopped a train and got into the interior. Yeah, we've always had them with trains in the river. I live up the mountain and my neighbors have one. Right. But the other thing that we have more of that's come back in vogue is open compost systems. Like we have a closed compost system in our house, we have two of them. But I know that people have open compost systems, so I wonder if that's a bit of a connection as well. It could be. So when we, we think back to um, the what does what do the animals need to survive? Food, water, shelter. And so um, if there's a composting system that's able to, uh, the animals are able to act that have food that's not composting properly or what have you, and they're able to access it, then that is a source of food. And, and that's what they need to live and when they're happy uh, living like that. And so it's possible. Uh, the recommendations are to have um, rodent-proof containers and have, if you're having compost, have even a screen mesh underneath so that they can't come up from underneath um, to compost. Mm -hmm. It is a source of food, for sure. Councilor okay. Nando, um, most of the steps outlined in your presentation and on the health link um, form here are sort of individual steps. Are there any uh, initiatives that have been undertaken at the municipal level to deal with the issue? Um, for what I'm probably the wrong person to, to speak to because I'm not on the ground operations in any municipality. I did a little bit of um, searching around and it looks to me that most municipalities approach it where private property is the responsibility of the private property owner and at public spaces, so parks, um, uh, public areas, roadways, that type of thing, if there's um, a problem or an issue, then that's where the municipality would, would address. Um, and then it doesn't go into how they address it. Um, so that, I guess that would be the, um, the municipal operations or works department that have a way to deal with it. So I'm sorry I didn't quite answer your question. But, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, and you know, you mentioned that a uh, food source in, in a mouse, for example, will nest five to ten feet away from the food source. Do you have any stats on how far a rat will uh, go for their food source? So, can you be living in, in my house and dining three doors down? Right. Um, I don't have it specific for rats, I can certainly do some looking up and, and get that number to you. I'm sure there's some information out there somewhere. Um, but if I just think about how these creatures live and that they are uh, prey to so many things, they're going to stay fairly close. They don't want to travel long distances. Every time they travel farther away from their, their nesting area, they are susceptible to be preyed on. And so they're going to try to stay 
as close as they can to their source of food and their source of water. Um, and the more that you make those things uninviting, you make your backyard, you make your house not their habitat, not suitable for them, then the less chance that you're going to decide that your house is the right place for them. But I can, I can try to find that number for you. Well, I guess what you know started this whole thing is that we are getting uh, people contacting uh, contacting the city about uh, seeing an increase in, in rats and you know, mostly rats, mice, and um, so we, we are going to be a lot more proactive this year. We just uh, introduced a, a wildlife attractant bylaw, and it's designed for mostly for bears, but the same attractants that attract bears attract rats and mice. And uh, the message that we want to get out to the, to the community is that it's everybody's responsibility and by having more information, what we can individually do about it, we're going to, uh, I hopefully, get a handle on this thing here and, and uh, not seeing it uh, expanding any more than it already is. And in fact, uh, we want to see it going in the other direction. So uh, the public is going to hear more uh, this year, especially on, uh, on the things that we can all do together to uh, reduce the, the, the rat population. And, and reduce the, the bears coming into the community as well. So uh, I want to thank you for coming and giving us that information. I know that the uh, media are going to be picking up. There are lots of people in, in the community that are concerned, we're concerned, and uh, together we're going to uh, deal with this problem. So thanks for coming in. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. Thanks for having me. There was um, one other comment that I could make is that um, the local environment health officer who whose job it is to inspect restaurants um, she hasn't seen any increase in restaurant-related rodent. So whether that they just have um, measures constantly. So we can't, we don't monitor going to uh, private people's homes, obviously property. Uh, but we do have uh, a requirement to oversee what happens in a public space, in restaurants or one of those public spaces. And um, the requirement is that people have uh, pest control um, measures in place, and uh, and so they, there is a bit of a monitoring there. And so she's uh, she's informed me that she hasn't seen any any feedback from restaurant owners that this is an issue for them. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you.